Hello, everyone, and welcome to Schmidt Ocean Institute's second Back Ashore, a series where we invite scientists who have sailed on board Falkor to join us and discuss outcomes since the end of their expedition. Today, we are joined by four Mariana Trench explorers to hear what they've been up to since they visited the region on Falkor. My name is Allison Miller, and I am the Research Portfolio Senior Manager at Schmidt Ocean Institute. Joining me today to talk about their science are Dr. Julie Huber from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Dr. Jeff Drazen from the University of Hawaii, Manoa, Dr. David Butterfield from both the University of Washington and NOAA, and Dr. Mackenzie Geringer from SUNY Geneseo, who is also at sea on board the Atlantis right now. We are going to revisit three of our expeditions that took place within the Mariana Trench Marine National Monument. And those expeditions took place in 2014, 2015, and 2016. Jeff and Mackenzie were scientists on board our 2014 expedition exploring the Mariana Trench. And David sailed on our 2015 expedition hydrothermal hunt at Mariana. Both David and Julie participated in the 2016 expedition searching for life in the Mariana back arc. The Mariana Trench sits within the Mariana Trench Marine National Monument off of the Mariana Islands, the ancestral home of the Chamorro people. Within the waters of the National Monument lies the deepest place on Earth, the Challenger Deep at 10,934 meters. The Mariana Trench sits at the beginning of the monument which is composed of the trench, the fore arc, the volcanic arc, and then the back arc. Overall, the Mariana Trench is quite long. It's 2,542 kilometers, but relatively narrow at only 69 kilometers wide. To give you some perspective, you could fit five Grand Canyons lengthwise into the Mariana Trench. And if Mount Everest were placed in the Challenger Deep, it would still be about 2,000 meters away from the surface. Each of Falcor's expeditions to the Mariana Trench had unique scientific objectives and utilized different technologies to achieve the goals of the scientists on board. Today, we will discuss the discoveries made, the impact of the research, how technology has transformed Mariana Trench exploration over the past eight years. I can't believe it's been eight years since Falcor first visited and Jeff and Mackenzie were on board and what goes into exploring these deep parts of our Earth. I want to remind the audience that we will have time for questions at the end, so please leave those in the chat and I'll make sure to address as many as I can with our scientists. So let's go ahead and get started talking to our scientists. Jeff and Mackenzie, as I mentioned, you were on board in 2014, which was eight years ago now. Can you tell us about the motivation behind studying the Mariana Trench in general and what the goals of your project exploring the Mariana Trench were? Yeah, um, the, the expedition to the Mariana Trench was part of a larger project to study hadal ecosystems. Hadal ecosystems are those that are deeper than about 6,000 meters in depth, and they are still some of the least explored places on the planet. It's a really intriguing habitat because, as you mentioned earlier, the trenches, some of them extend down to about 11 kilometers. And so the depths that you find there represent about 45% of the total depth range, the habitat depth range in the ocean. So understanding the ecosystems, the animals that live in these places, how they live there is really important to understanding uh, life on the planet. And we went to the Mariana Trench with this goal of doing more than what had been, been done before. There was a lot of emphasis earlier on on very simple sampling technologies. It's a really hard place to go to. It's a difficult place to sample because of those crushing depths. And so previous studies had lowered grabs on a wire from a ship where they had used very simple dredges. And while those studies were really important, they sort of documented inventories of animals and didn't give us the best understanding of everything that lived in those habitats and how those communities were structured, how they changed, how they responded to, to differences in environmental characteristics. I think one of the other real important parts of why we went to the Mariana Trench as well is that there had previously been a big focus on going to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. 
And that's a great engineering feat. And if you're interested in how microbes are adapted to high pressures, then of course you want to go there. So there's some good reasons to go to the Challenger Deep, but the trench is far bigger place than its deepest point. It's kind of like, if you want to know what lives in a trench, going to the Challenger Deep only is like exploring a mountain and only going to its summit, looking around and seeing the ice and the rocks. So we wanted to explore the trench from top to bottom. And we wanted to do this in a systematic way so we could really describe the structure of communities in, in trenches. And I'll Thank just you. add that this also um, involves bringing a big uh, perspective from different scientific groups. And so we were able to bring together geologists and microbiologists and people who study animals to answer these questions on a really holistic scale. Thanks, Mackenzie. You both made a great point about studying not just the deepest point, but the entire trench and all aspects and interdisciplinary topics that um, exist and um, can be studied down there. So that's a great kickoff. Um, Jeff, you used full ocean depth landers equipped with cameras, sensors, and sample collection devices to study the deep dark zones. Could you tell us more about how the landers were used for your research and what they helped you accomplish? And just to let our readers know in 2014, um, rather our listeners, in 2014, RV Sebastian had not been built yet. So we were using different technology on board Falcor at the time. Yeah, well, I, I, what you're seeing in, in the background behind me and on the slides now are what we refer to as landers. These are vehicles that have flotation, that yellow component at the top. And they have instruments on them, such as cameras or respirometers or, or baited traps, a variety of different things. And they're deployed off the side of a ship. They sink to the seafloor. They do their job on the bottom. And then sometime later, we come back and we send a communication signal to them. They release their weights and they come back to the surface where we can recover them back onto the boat. And so these landers are quite wonderful tools for sampling really uh, deep uh, environments, not just the trenches, but all, all across the deep sea. And uh, we used, I think, six different landers. We had some that were outfitted with cameras, some with traps, uh, some with grabs to collect sediments and rocks from the seafloor. We had one uh, lander that actually had tube cores that would push into the mud and collect cores of mud and measure the respiration rates of all the microbes and biology in the, in the, in the mud at the bottom of the trench. And uh, we used these, these landers quite successfully uh, in our 30-day expedition. We had 92 deployments of, of landers. It was in quite a, I think it was a personal best for most of us on, on board the ship. We, we ran through stations starting at five kilometers depth and all the way down to the axis, just shy of 11 kilometers of depth. And then we went back up the other side of the trench as well, sampling two, two different sides with slightly different environmental variables. So uh, I don't know if you want me to tell you a bit about what we discovered then and since, um, but I can uh, maybe just wait for some of these pictures here. Uh, what you're seeing here are some of the animals we collected in baited traps. That's the Mariana snailfish right there. I think that's in Mackenzie's hand. Um, and that's Paul Yancey on the right and then Patty Fryer on the left, two of our coach, our, uh, Patty was co-chief scientist and, and, and Paul was another uh, PI. Uh, and uh, they're holding specimens that we collected from these landers. So um, there's Tom and Mackenzie, and, uh, and they're probably dissecting fishes. We collected a lot of animals. Um, I think that some of the interesting things that we found from these expeditions, we collected a lot of, of organisms, and Mackenzie can talk to you about some of the adaptations that we uh, uh, began to understand about how these animals survive under the crushing pressures in the trench. They use some real novel physiological mechanisms to deal with the high pressure. And uh, there's also a video that we could probably play that shows what we saw with the cameras. And we found that the animals living in the trenches 
differ quite a lot as you descend through depth. So this is some video from one of Alan Jameson's uh, landers that he had outfitted with cameras and lights. And you can see here, this is at 5,000 meters deep, and you can see these large fishes that are called cusk eels. And there's a very large shrimp. And that's sort of what abyssal uh, habitats look like at shallower depths. And then as this video proceeds, you're gonna see that the animals change. And this was a real important finding of, of our work. Instead of these cusk eels and rat tails and, and other organisms, the community changes and it becomes dominated by um, snail fishes, smaller fishes and uh, amphipods, these little crustaceans. Right now we're still looking at the shallower depths Five, this is 6,000 meters and that's a giant amphipod. These animals are about that big. Um, and, uh, and they come to feed on the bait. The, uh, speed the video up a little bit there, here we go. Oh. But uh, Mackenzie can probably show you a video in a little bit of the snailfish that we saw between about 6,000 and 8,000 meters, but there's a completely different community that lives in these zones. And we've seen this now in other trenches as well. It's not just the Mariana Trench. And when you get below 8,000 meters, uh, a number of animal groups disappear because they don't have the adaptations required to live under those high pressures. So fishes disappear, large shrimps disappear, and you really have kingdom of the amphipod, which are these very small crustaceans swimming around in their thousands around the bait when you get to these great depths. They no longer have the predators on them, such as the shrimps and the fishes, and their abundance is really sore. And it's, uh, it's really striking to see this, this zonation, which is the same sort of thing you would see in the intertidal zone or on a mountain. As you go up a mountain, the communities of trees and animals change. And, and the same is true in a trench. And it really showed just how important it was to study the whole trench, not just that deepest point. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, touching back on that. Mackenzie, I think this video and a little bit of what Jeff said teed you up great. But during that expedition, some of the more uh, newsworthy items was discovering the deepest fish, the Mariana snailfish, and catching that on video. Um, and you've since uh, co-authored several publications about new species that were discovered on the expedition. Could you tell us more about these new species that were discovered and how they survive at deep depths? My pleasure. So I think for a lot of us, when we picture a deep sea fish, we picture something like a viper fish or an angler fish, something very toothy. But when you get to these deepest depths, the fish community looks really different. We're left at the very bottom with this small pink fish called a snail fish that are the deepest living fish in um, the oceans and, uh, and live in multiple trenches. And you can see here that they don't look like you might imagine the deepest living fish to look. We're actually looking all the way through the fish's skin at the liver. And when you hold them in your hand, you can look straight through the skull and see the brain. So even though they look relatively fragile, they're able to survive under these high pressures in these trench ecosystems. And so the Mariana snailfish was a especially exciting discovery. Um, we knew of snailfishes in other trenches, the first one of which was filmed in 2010. So this is all relatively new stuff. Um, but we didn't know if there was one in the Mariana Trench. And so it was really exciting to find that fish and then to see how deep these organisms can live. So one of the things that I'm really interested in is how they're able to survive under that high pressure. And it turns out they need a lot of different adaptations to do it. But one of the really notable ones is that they use a small pressure stabilizing molecule called TMAO to help keep their cellular machinery working under high pressure. And this acronym may not be familiar to you, but you might know TMAO because it oxidizes into TMA. And so if you smell a fish, 
you're actually smelling that TMA that's gassing out of the fish. So it is the fishy smell. But for these deep sea fishes, it helps them to survive under um, high pressure, which uh, Paul Yancey, who you saw earlier, has shown. And so we think, though, that as you go deeper, into the ocean, you need more and more of this pressure stabilizing molecule, but at a certain point, the cell can't hold any more stuff before it becomes the same concentration as seawater. And that happens at about 8,200 meters ish, depending on the temperature. And so um, we do think that this is still the deepest living fish known. Um, it was a very exciting discovery. And I'll say we named it, uh, the scientific name is Pseudoleparis spireye, and it's named um, in thank you of all the crews that work on oceanographic vessels, because as we've uh, mentioned and hopefully made clear, it takes a lot of people to make these discoveries, to make this work. And so we wanted to honor those crews who are keeping the ship going, who are you know keeping the engine going, keeping the crew fed, all of those things um, in order to make these oceanographic research programs work. Thanks, Mackenzie. That's a great name and in honor of everyone that works really hard, like you said, kind of behind the scenes. And I'll never smell a fish the same way because I actually did not know that about the fish smell. <laughs> David, you were on board in 2015 um, to the Mariana region in our expedition hydrothermal hunt at Mariana and used an autonomous mm. underwater vehicle that we rented from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute as um, Falcor had still not been built at this point. So what were the goals of your expedition in 2015 and how did using the AUV help you accomplish them? Yeah, thanks, Allison. Um, well, the our group at NOAA PMEL called the Earth Ocean Interactions Group now, we used to be known as the Vents Group. Um, we've been studying the Mariana region since about 2003. And in the map that you see here, um, you can see that this is a big subduction zone. Uh, to the right side of this figure is the Pacific plate, and it's subducting underneath the Phil Philippine Sea plate, which is to the far left. Um, and you go across this huge gradient from the trench that Jeff and Mackenzie were just talking about, um, up the slope of the fore arc to the volcanic arc, which is that line of uh, Submarine, mostly submarine volcanoes with some islands uh, extending the length of the whole Mariana region. Um, and then behind that, you've got the back arc where the, the mantle flow associated with uh, subduction and the movement of the plates creates a spreading environment where two plates are spreading apart. So that environment there is similar to what we see on the mid-ocean ridge. Uh, where two ocean plates are spreading apart and forming new crust. So you've got this tremendous range of tectonic and geological, geochemical environments uh, across from the trench uh, through the arc and the back arc. Um, so we were trying to, uh, number one, fill the gap of unexplored area that you see in the blue outline box there on the back arc. Um, the white dots at both ends were known hydrothermal sites, uh, but there was really no studies between those two areas. So we wanted to do a large survey um, detecting, uh, looking for hydrothermal plumes and active volcanoes. So to do that, um, typically you use a ship with a, an instrument package called the CTD that measures conductivity, temperature, pressure, and some other parameters. Um, and this uh, figure on the screen right now um, shows a section of, uh, of our approach, which is um, the, the zigzaggy line you see going up and down across the screen. That is the tow path of the CTD instrument through the water column. Um, we measure temperature, particle concentration, um, some chemical parameters, oxygen and redox uh, potential. And those respond very well to hydrothermal plumes. So um, you can slowly tow this instrument package while raising it up and down through the depths where you normally find the plumes, which is up to a few hundred meters off the bottom typically. Um, and uh, target areas where you think there could be hydrothermal activity. So this is kind of a slow process. Uh, but this first figure shows you that we did see the, you know, the plume extending up into the water column. 
Well, it's hard to tell from just that plume information in the water where the sources are because the plumes can drift back and forth um, with the currents and it can be difficult to find a site just based on that. So the reason we wanted to have an AUV autonomous vehicle uh, as part of this mission is we could first get a general idea where the sites were, then we could program the AUV to go down and map near the bottom. And this grid pattern that you see um, close to the seafloor here, the, the blue and different colored uh, dotted lines there, that represents data, um, in this case, I believe it's temperature uh, that was recorded near the seafloor, um, but the other sensors on board, the especially the, the redox potential sensor, are really sensitive to any kind of hydrothermal output. So we set up a pattern in the general area where we think this venting might occur, send the AUV down, and in addition to getting a really high resolution uh, seafloor map out of this, because it's got a great uh, multi-beam sonar system on it, um, we get these signals for where there might be hydrothermal activity. And you can see there's a really clear line sort of across the middle of this figure where we get these reds and orange uh, colors. Um, that's the strongest uh, signal near the seafloor for hydrothermal venting. So all of that was generated within a couple days of work on the 2015 uh, Falcor expedition using the CTD and the AUV. So all of that was enough, and this is just a map view of the whole of where we did the pattern. Uh, the, the grid pattern there is sort of right in the middle of the spreading center, and you can see a line going up the middle. That's our CTD tow path uh, for the Toyos. Um, so that set us up for the subsequent ROV work. Um, so without an AUV, we really would not have had good ROV dive targets because you can, if you have a plume in the water, you could wander around for days or weeks with an ROV on the seafloor. It's like, you know, using a flashlight to explore a dark cave. And um, you might never come across the vent sites, but with that AUV data, we pretty much knew exactly where to look. Um, we passed that information on to the NOAA Okeanos Explorer Group. And within six months of our Falcor cruise in 2015, they were out there with the, with the Okeanos and dove on this site and got some preliminary information. And then we went back out in 2016, Julie and I, and using the new Sebastian ROV, uh, we did some detailed studies of the different vent fields that we found. Um, and here's a pretty spectacular picture of one of the black smoker sites that we found in that in that 17 North uh, vent field. Um, uh, some of the largest structures anywhere, um, and certainly the largest we know of on the Mariana back arc. Um, here's a view of that uh, of a similar structure low down. You can see the trunk. Uh, coming up at the bottom of the picture like a giant tree trunk. And then it's got these large horizontal growths out the side um, that grow these massive uh, extensions off of, the, off of the main trunk. Eventually they all become too heavy to support themselves and they fall off and make a giant pile of debris at the bottom of this trunk. Um, these are some of the typical animals that we found living on the in this case, the vertical side of, a, of one of these large uh, sulfide mineral towers. Um, one of the reasons some are interested in these areas is that the sulfide minerals represent a potential critical mineral resource, uh, but they're also the, the habitat for all of the, the animals that live there. So uh, you can't separate the habitat from the mineral in this case, and so, uh, we're interested in documenting what lives where on the back arc um, and how it compares to the to the arc. And this is a picture of the, the Mariana arc. So different geological setting. There are a bunch of discrete volcanoes uh, located up and down the arc instead of like one long linear uh, spreading center with volcanic eruptions distributed all along it you get concentrated activity at specific volcanic sites. 
and the chemistry is extremely different. So here you see the yellow uh, deposits on the seafloor and the white smoke. Those are both sulfur dominated, elemental sulfur. Um, they, there is sulfur dioxide gas coming out of the, of the magma chambers here. And that produces sulfuric acid. It generates extremely low pH fluids and all of this elemental sulfur. And uh, it's, it's very different from the back arc, which has pH that's close to neutral, uh, lots of hydrogen sulfide, very similar to mid-ocean ridge environments. So the conditions for chemistry of the habitat are really different between the arc and the back arc. So we're kind of looking at the gradient of sites that are not very far apart. As we said, the, the, the entire region is only 60 kilometers or so wide. Um, so these habitats are very close to each other, but you get a very different set of animals living in the different places because they are so different. Thanks, Dave. That was a great geology and chemistry lesson um, about the, the trench in the back arc region. And, just like the 2015 cruise um, teed up the 2016 cruise, I think you've also um, teed up Julie well um, to talk about the 2016 expedition, Searching for Life in the Mariana Back Arc, which as you mentioned, revisited some of those sites. And Julie, you examined the microbes living in those hydrothermal vents in the Back Arc. What have you learned so far about these microbes? Yeah, well, first, I'll just say it's always great to step in for the glory leg, right? So all the CTDs, all the AUVs, uh, we had one ROV that was able to get new imagery. And so to just step on board and, you know, within 24 hours of, of arriving on site, be able to see some of the spectacular imagery uh, was really great. Uh, so, I, yeah, I study single-celled life, so no charismatic amphipods or snailfish or anything like that. But these microbes form the base of the food chain in these deep-sea hydrothermal vent habitats. So these are uh, microbes that are using chemical energy from the volcano, uh, fixing carbon, and that forms sort of the primary production that supports all these lush animal communities we find in the region. Uh, and you know, I, this was my first time working in a back arc, and what I found really fascinating was the variation along the arc. As Dave showed in the beginning, we went from north to south. Uh, so this is one of our more robust smokers that we saw with these really cool, you know, you know, even the best architect might not design a, a building looking like this. Uh, just really beautiful chimney structures and other things. And I was interested in how do the microbial communities vary along the arc, which are separate, or back arc, excuse me, which are separated not only just by distance, but also they're under different um, magmatic settings um, and the resulting chemistry is also different. And what we basically found is that in the very middle of the arc, uh, back arc, where we had the most robust hydrothermal activity, the microbial communities actually looked different from what we saw at the northern end and the southern end. And we think that is basically because there's this, uh, there's more magmatic activity, there's a higher eruption rate, uh, we got higher temperature fluids, um, more concentrations of things like hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide, and those are all energy sources that microbes use uh, to grow and thrive in these environments. Uh, and so, this is such a great image of the arm of Sebastian trying very carefully <laughs> to sample the black smoke coming out of these fluids. Um, and the shrimp are always quite interested in the probe coming up and seeing what's there. And so we had a number of animal biologists sailing with us as well. And they were looking at the distribution of the fauna along the back arc and how it compared to the arc. And so I was basically doing the same thing, just looking at things where you need to use a microscope or DNA sequencing or other tools to examine them. And this is actually, uh, this is the Daikoku volcano, which is at the arc. Uh, Dave already talked about the cool chemistry at this site. This is one of my favorite places to visit, even though it's, it's pretty hard to collect fluid samples from because there is so much gas in them that when you bring them up, you have to be careful that they don't uh, depressurize too much and explode. Uh, and then this is back in the back arc. 
Um, and so the animals at these two sites were totally different, right? On the back arc, we're seeing crabs, shrimp, those scaly snails. Um, and on the arc volcano, we basically saw at that Daikoku site, um, these flatfish, really weird flatfish, I would say. Um, I think it's the only place I've seen flatfish at underwater volcanoes is along, along the arc. Um, and I did want to mention, right, we only mapped part of the Mariana back arc. Uh, and the southern portion has been studied quite a bit, and it's still a long-term goal to map that final northern uh, extent of the back arc to get a complete picture of the range of hydrothermal activity of the animals and the geology. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, a full map, of course, would be excellent. Thank you all for those uh, great overviews of the expeditions. Like Mackenzie mentioned in the beginning, I think we've really shown how interdisciplinary science can work and how all different aspects of science can um, study one, one area of the world's ocean. I just wanted to remind our viewers to ask questions of our scientists. We'll save room at the end. And I have a few questions for kind of the group in general. Um, I know that studying these uh, organisms and life very deep in the ocean takes time, as does all the analysis and data that you come home with. Could you tell us about the analysis that you are still working on from your expeditions or any recent results that you would like to share with us? Um, let's start with Mackenzie for this one. Sure. Um this expedition was such an amazing opportunity to collect this uh, this fish in particular for the first time. And we really started from, OK, we're going to describe it scientifically and then also answer all sorts of questions about how it lives under pressure, what it's doing in the community. And so we've looked at what they're eating and found they're mostly eating those amphipods that you've seen swimming around. We've also recently published um, in collaboration with Jeff, as well as um, a Jeff student, Andrew Shakuda, on what those um, fish and other hadal uh, organisms look like as a food web. So not only what do they look like as individual organisms, but what does the community connections look like? Um, we still have projects looking at pressure adaptation of these fishes. So trying to understand if their bone structure is different under high pressure or how each of their molecules working in the cell uh, reacts to high pressure because it turns out there's like a lot of complexity and different compounds are going to respond differently to pressure. So um, the fish themselves have been deposited in public museum collections. And so you can, uh, as a scientist, check out that specimen from, for example, the Smithsonian and uh, do work on it. And so these um, resources that we've collected will continue to produce scientific information for a long time. Thanks for that point, Mackenzie. Uh, sh sharing the data and also the specimens is very important and a critical piece of uh, SOI's mission. Jeff, would you like to add anything else about the 2014 expedition? Well, I guess just to sort of hammer home the point that once you collect so many really valuable and rare specimens, you keep using them for a very long time. So to continue that food web thread, we use some of the specimens that we collected to look at mercury in, in these deep living animals. And one of the interesting things about trenches is that they're funnels and they seem to be repositories for a lot of uh, naturally occurring and, and perhaps anthropogenically induced waste. And we're finding plastic in, in these animals and we've found organic pollutants and, and we found very high concentrations of mercury. And that mercury based on its isotopes comes from near surface waters basically carcasses of things like tunas sinking from depth. Those tunas accumulate anthropogenic mercury in surface waters and they sink into the trenches. And it just illustrates that even though the trench seems like such a remote place, so many miles from the surface, that it's actually really closely linked to what we as a human society do and how we're connected to surface waters. These, these places are, are not as distant as we think. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Dave and Julie, would you like to share what you're still working on? Sure. Uh, one of the things that we did on the cruise was we cultured some of the microbes, like so actually grew them in test tubes from the bottom of the ocean um, and have isolated them in the lab. And for the last couple of summers, I've had 
a number of community college students working to characterize them, uh, sequence their genome, and try to understand how they're related to their, you know, closest relatives, right? So there, there I am on the ship culturing these microbes, um, putting them in anaerobic tubes, giving them hydrogen in the headspace, all the things I think they want to eat. Um, and what's kind of interesting is, you know, microbes are not like animals or they have these huge effective population sizes. They can kind of drift through the water, but we're actually finding there are some groups of microbes that we only find in specific regions of uh, the ocean and specific hydrothermal systems. And so this group of students is working on six isolates we have of one particular group, all from the Mariana back arc. And so I'm really uh, excited to keep working with them to see you know, who they are, what they're doing, and how they're related to other microbes from the deep sea. Yeah, so um, I've been out with Julie many times since going back to about 1998, and the chemistry and microbiology are really tightly linked. So uh, we've we've enjoyed a lot of collaborations on trying to figure out how the microbial communities are related to the chemical environment. Um, for the for the Mariana trip, um, we come back with a lot of water samples to analyze. Uh, so uh, some of the analysis we do on board the ship, uh, but then a lot more happens once we get back. Um, we've got a, a database of different sites from the Mariana Arc and Back Arc. Um, we're putting all that information together and working on the hypothesis that um, the chemical environment exert some control on what animals can colonize different sites and survive. And that seems very obvious when you look at the places, but we are trying to do the statistical analysis that will confirm that. So uh, we're still working on sort of combining the, the biological data set, the chemistry, and information about the substrates where these animals are living. And some of those pictures you were seeing, um, the sort of sandy uh, deposits with sulfur uh, that are typical of the arc versus the metal sulfide chimneys that are more typical of the back arc. Those substrates that the animals live on seem to be really critical. Uh, like they will not land and develop on volcanic rocks. Uh, they will only survive on either metal sulfide chimneys or in these sulfur rich deposits. Um, I don't know if you could find that picture of the fish that was up a minute ago. Uh, there are some little things in there to, to notice. Um, right, and that could be linked potentially to microbes, right? Colonizing those surfaces first and creating a safe place for an animal to develop their their, their uh, community. Okay, well, I can, I can tell you what was <laughs> in the, the picture of the fish, which there it is. Okay, here, here are the flatfish. They're living on these uh, volcanic plastic sand deposits that have uh, white sulfur mats on top. Um, and in this picture, you can also, I don't know if it's too visible online, but you can see these little tadpole like shaped things, which in some of the video before you saw floating through the water, those are little molten sulfur bubbles filled with hot gas. Uh, they come out of these tiny little orifices and float up into the water until they cool off enough and get crushed and sink back down. And there's literally, they're just littering the seafloor here. These fish just seem to love sulfur. They, we only see them on sulfur. In some cases we see them swimming over the top of a molten sulfur pond. I don't have any video of that up here, but uh, picture a, you know, a pond of melted sulfur on the bottom of the ocean. It's hot, it's like a hundred and, 20 degrees Celsius or so, or possibly hotter, uh, hotter than boiling water. And these fish are just kind of skating along over the surface of that. So they really seem to be attracted to sulfur and nothing else. And so we're trying to figure out um, why that is and, and answer other questions through statistical analysis of the data. 
Excellent. I'm glad to hear all of the exciting analysis that's still ongoing and your sounds like you're getting your money's worth of um, analysis from all of the samples and also making them publicly available for others. So that's really great to hear. I alluded to this a little bit when I was asking everyone their individual questions, but you each of the expeditions utilize different technology for observing the seafloor and the deep parts of the ocean um, from the landers to the AUVs to the ROVs. Could you talk about the, the merits of the technology that was used on your expedition and why you think it worked best for you to achieve your goals or if there was technology on board that you wish you had had um, on board Falcor? And maybe I'll start with you, Julie, this time. Uh I mean, we we used like like Dave said, a CTD, an AUV, an ROV. They were all tripped out with the right sensors that we needed, and uh, we were the first leg to use the ROV Sebastian, which was also really fun. Um, I'd used two other vehicles on the Felcor, and you know, operating at the depths we were working at, you know, greater than 3,500 meters is tough with an ROV. You're dragging a lot of cable through the water column, uh, but you know, I was really impressed. You know, I was the one who almost broke the ROV because I I, I overfilled something uh, and it imploded on the way up. But one big advantage of working with a remotely operated vehicle is, uh, you know, nobody was in danger um, and Sebastian was fine. Uh, so we actually, we had a great set of tools for the work we wanted to do out there. You know, our biggest challenge was, was just the weather. You know, we had a lot of uh, high winds and right on the window of comfort for launching something like Sebastian over the side. Uh, but overall, the tools that we brought were the right tools for, for the science we wanted to accomplish. Good to hear. And thank you for not breaking Sebastian all the way on it, its first time. I, I only broke our sampler. So. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, in the video here, you can see where our hydrothermal fluid sampler is located, sort of sandwiched in there between the different layers of the Sebastian ROV. Um, yeah, I think uh, the tools we had worked really well. Um, it was a very challenging trip in 2016 because of weather primarily. Oh, there's Verena Tunnicliffe. Shout out to her for being our longtime biology colleague. She's, she's done amazing work. Um, so yeah, the weather was a challenge. We we missed a lot of dive opportunities because well, we started off dodging a typhoon at the very beginning of the cruise. Um, we couldn't dive from south to north because the weather was so bad. So we just had to keep going north until the weather was okay to dive, and then we turned around and worked our way back to Guam. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, the tool set that we had was quite good. Uh, if you know, if we had faster AUVs that could, you know, do automated seafloor photography and make a photo mosaic map by the time they get got back to the surface, you know, that would be even better. But uh, the tools we have worked pretty well. And I, I uh, appreciate the difficulties that Jeff and Mackenzie have trying to go to 10,000 meters or more because we, we couldn't use the ROV beyond uh, 4,000 meters or so. So... Yeah, the RVs depth rated to 4,500 meters. So I think you probably hit that limit. Um, Jeff, would you like to talk about the landers or uh, and how they helped you achieve your goals or if there's something else you wish you had on board? Yeah, well, the landers are great because you can set up an experiment, drop it off the ship, set up the next experiment, drop that off the ship, and you keep going. And so you have multiple things going at one time. And you drop all of these landers to the sea floor. They can be sampling different depths, doing different things. And, and so, you know, in this way, this is one of the camera landers that you're seeing on the video right now. And all those orange things are the flotation spheres. The camera itself is on the tripod underneath the A-frame there. And, and so landers are a really great tool, but you only sample points in space. And initially we wanted to be using an ROV on our cruise and that was the ROV Narius. But uh, 
uh, that vehicle was lost earlier in the year of our expedition uh, when we were at sea in the Kermadec Trench. And it's it just goes to show it's really hard to do operations at these hadal depths. The Venarius ROV imploded at 10,000 meters. Um, so there are uh, now, Alan Jameson has been using a, a, a deep rated submersible, two person submersible and doing all kinds of interesting video transecting and, and things of that nature uh, in a number of the different trenches uh, around the world. And so there are now some technologies that are replacing what we, what we had lost when, when the Nereus uh, uh, disappeared in 2014. So, but landers are still wonderful tools. And I think that, you know, in an ideal world, you want all the tools. They all have pros and cons. And the best cruise is one in which you can employ all of the, the, the tools available to you. Definitely. I love that. Mackenzie, do you have anything to add? I was going to make that same message is that the tool that you use affects what you see. And so it is really important to think, what are, what am I missing by looking with this method? And is there a way that I can capture more temporal resolution, looking over longer time scales, over larger spatial scales? And so no one tool is ever going to be the perfect answer. It's a matter of using a combination of resources to answer these questions. Definitely. Well, Jeff, I think you alluded to this a little bit, but um... And it's hard to believe our first expedition was over eight years ago now, but how has the technology changed over the past, let's say eight to 10 years for exploring the deep sea? And Jeff, I'll let you start since you started to talk about this a little bit. Sure, yeah, I think that the Hadal technology is changing very rapidly. And uh, there were a number of, of entities that are developing Hadal rated uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, there are now some submarines, as I already alluded to. Victor Vescovo's uh, vehicle is, is a two person full ocean depth rated uh, submersible. Uh, the, the Chinese have uh, uh, the Xiaolong, which I'm trying to remember. Mackenzie will probably know just how deep it's been now, but um, there's a uh, there's a number of other assets that have been de developed just recently to explore the very deepest depths of, of the ocean. Uh, here at UH, we are developing uh, um, an instrument that's called a profiler that actually descends through the water column and samples the water column, not just the seafloor. Uh, we call it the Hadal water column profiler. So there's a lot of the limits that we have to trench science are technological limits. So there's a, a lot of effort right now to develop assets that can work at these crushing pressures and enable us to sample the ways we want to. Does anyone have anything to add to that? I'll add that um, I'm excited to be on board the RV Atlantis, where we are on the science verification cruise for the Alvin 6500. So the Alvin um, submersible has been refitted to be rated 6,500 meters. And so getting to explore these upper trench sites as well as about 98% of the ocean. So we're very excited about that technology. Thanks, Mackenzie. And best of luck while you're out there. Have you been down in Alvin yet since you've been out there? Uh, this is our second day out here, so uh, I hope, <laughs> so I hope not yet. to. <laughs> Great. Um, what was your favorite uh, memory from the expedition that will stay stay with you, either scientifically or, or something kind of personal about the expedition um, you were on? And I will let Dave start with this one. Okay, well, there's just so many things. Just the whole experience of um, combining those two missions where we did the water column, you know, hydrothermal hunt mission, and then the, the back arc ROV mission. Uh, I thought it was just amazingly successful. Um, finding those vent fields in the first place is not that easy. And then getting down there and having successful ROV dives and the things we saw were, you know, just visually stunning. Uh, that giant vent field at 17 North. Um, yeah, here's a, you know, crabs living, walking around on molten sulfur deposits. And, and these are the little sulfur bubbles forming and floating off into the water. Uh, I remember the first dive, possibly the first 
deep science dive for the Sebastian. We were at Daikoku Volcano and it's a pretty active place. And we were flying over a sulfur vent and it decided to erupt and, and blew a bunch of sulfur all over the front of the ROV on its very first dive. So uh, no real harm done, but it made quite a mess. Um, and the, um, the vent field at 17 North, there's a structure there which we called uh, Voodoo Crater. It's a perfectly circular uh, structure that really stands out on the map. Um, and we were curious to what it was. Normally I would look at that and think, oh, it's some kind of volcanic eruption crater feature, uh, but it was totally flat volcanic rock underneath and the circle was made up entirely of metal sulfide chimney debris and the center was empty so it's a, you were having a hard time understanding that was it some kind of giant explosion where a chimney just blew itself to pieces uh, it would be pretty unusual for that to happen at 3,000 meters depth although things like that happen uh, in shallow systems uh, so we're still scratching our heads as to how that formed uh, and, and made that circular crater. Interesting. Well, maybe Voodoo Crater is the right name for it then. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like Dave and I um, keep talking about how we almost hurt the brand new sub <laughs> Sebastian. Um, but my favorite memory was actually from that Daikoku volcano because we live streamed that video back to land. And at, at one point we had 2 million viewers. We, we went through um, a website called IFLS. And the, for, the most common question we were getting from the audiences was, you know, is this, is this a, in outer space? You know, it was just so foreign to our viewers. And I thought that was really exciting and humbling that we were able to share that video with everybody and it was so foreign that people didn't actually believe it was right there um, on earth. So that was that was my favorite memory from the cruise. Awesome, yeah, being able to stream online is great for, for that excitement. Jeff, what was your favorite memory? Well, I think one of my favorite memories is when we put down one of our landers and it was one that was designed to measure respiration on the seafloor, but it had a little camera on it to make sure that the cores got pushed in the mud correctly and that all the experiment went according to plan. And we had brought the thing back and it was in excess of eight, it was just around 8,000 meters. And there was an engineer who was reviewing that video because after all, it was just to sort of make sure that the little experiment went the way it was supposed to and he's like he thought he saw this little fish swim by and he thought oh well, you know jeff's a fish guy mackenzie's a fish person maybe they should come see this so he comes and gets us and uh sure enough this was the very first video of a species of fish that we had never seen before um, from the mariana trench and we call it the ethereal snailfish and uh this thing just swam past our little instrument with these sort of diaphanous pectoral fins spread out to the side. It almost looked like a drifting piece of toilet paper. It was a, a very fragile looking thing. And so obviously different than anything we knew from, from other trenches or from other places. It was, it was great. It was just one of those discovery moments. Awesome. You gave a, a great description of it as well. Mackenzie, we'll finish with you. The same. Um, and I think that this ethereal snailfish discovery really drives home that even having studied these trench ecosystems for more than 10 years, there's still things that humble and amaze and surprise us. There's so much in these deep ocean ecosystems that's beautiful, that's amazing, that has potential to help humankind, and they're really worth um, continuing to explore. So I'll, I'll echo that same memory. Awesome. We do have one um, question from the audience and um, they wanted to know the main environmental difference between the volcanic arc and the back arc. So maybe Julie or Dave, do you want to start with that? Um, sure, I can tell you. So, so if, if you go, I'll, I'll expand that a little. If you go from the trench to the fore arc, to the arc, to the back arc, there's this huge gradient where um, subduction is putting all these volatiles, water, CO2, et cetera, down into the mantle. And then that causes melting and they come out 
in the arc. So the arc is a result of excess melting from the subduction. The chemistry of the lavas there is really different. It's got a lot more volatile content to it, a lot more water and sulfur and CO2 uh, that's been contributed from subduction. That causes the fluids to be really low pH and sulfur rich. So um, you see these sulfur deposits on the arc. Those are not there on the back arc. The back arc, you get big metal sulfide chimneys, um, fluids that are hotter usually. They're from a deeper reaction zone, a typical sort of basalt seawater reaction zone. And they're more close to neutral pH, although they can be quite hot. Um, and so they're less gases, more neutral pH. Those are the big differences between the, the sites. Thanks, Dave. Do you have, does anyone else have anything to add to that question? Yeah, I'll just say that the arc is probably one of the craziest places I've worked before. Every volcano along that arc is a little bit different. Um, and, you know, they're, they're more, they remind me more of sort of a distinct islands. Um, and I think there's a lot more work to be done in the arc as well. Great. Well, we got one last question um, about upcoming expeditions and further exploration taking place. And Julie and Dave, you are actually scheduled to be one of the first expeditions out on board Falcor 2. So Julie, I'm hoping you don't break Falcor 2 or we would be in big trouble. But um, maybe to wrap things up, uh, you guys could quickly talk about what you're planning to study on board the new vessel. I'll let Dave talk about the science, but I'll just say I was on one of the Falcor's first expeditions as well. And uh, we ran that yes. ship through its paces and we didn't break it. So we've never <laughs> broken anything. We've even used Nereus on it and we didn't break Nereus. <laughs> yes, so. you were on one of the first okay. um, expeditions. Yeah, you have a good track record with us so far. So. <laughs> Dave, go ahead. Yeah, it's funny. I, it's how Julie and I end up being the, the first on the Falcor, the first to put an ROV on the Falcor, although that was Ropos, the first to use Sebastian. Now we'll be one of the first groups out with the new ship. Uh, and the project we have there is to go to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Originally, we were going to do the second half of the back arc and do the northern half from 18 up to about 23. But the new ship is going to be in the Atlantic Ocean. So the project we have in mind there is to search for um, a different type of hydrothermal venting that's associated with the reaction of seawater with exposed mantle rocks. And in these slow spreading uh, environments, uh, especially around uh, transform faults, you get big exposures of uh, the underlying mantle where the volcanic layer has been removed through a detachment faulting. And those mantle rocks are really different from the volcanic rocks that we typically see on the uh, ocean crust. And they produce a type of venting that's related to the serpentinization reaction, which makes high pH fluids um, that form uh, carbonate structures when the fluids vent. Um, there was a picture up on the screen a little while ago of one of the Lost City uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, carbonate chimneys. So in a way, we're looking for more sites like that. Uh, there's only, well, there are a few sites around the globe that are known to have uh, carbonate chimneys. Um, Lost City has the largest and most spectacular of those, um, but the type of geologic environment where Lost City exists um, on a, you know, oceanic core complex uh, close to a transform fault, um, and here's the picture of the Lost City Carbonate Towers taken in 2018. Uh, Susan Lang was the chief scientist on that cruise. Anyway, we're looking for this type of venting in places where people haven't looked very much before, and we'll use the same kind of technology, CTD, AUV, and ROV all on one cruise. Since we have a bigger ship to work with, we can take more people and more equipment. So we're going to try to compress all of it into one cruise and try to find some new sites and, and characterize them. 
Sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. So everyone stay tuned for spring 2023 and hopefully we'll be live streaming a lot of that also. So I think that we are about out of time. I truly wanted to thank all of you for taking the time to talk with us and the audience we had on YouTube about um, what took place in the Mariana Trench National Monument and all of your analysis and work so far. And I'm really looking forward to some publications and ongoing uh, analysis and outcomes from your work. So thank you so much. Thank you and good luck, Mackenzie. We're keeping our fingers crossed for you guys out there. <laughs>